Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another edition of our FYI uh, webinar series with Palkus. My name is Angela Samoz, and um, today's webinar is about the history of the Portuguese American Citizenship Project from 1999 to 2016. It was a project where um, it was a national effort to not only register folks to vote, but encourage voting. And so uh, that project has been documented in a book. Um, and we are here with Jim McGlinchey, um, who will he'll kind of take us through the whole project. But before we do that, uh, just some housekeeping items here. If you have a, a question, please put it in, type it into the chat box because everybody is on mute uh, just to eliminate uh, background noise. So if you have a question, type it here. And then after the webinar, if you have additional questions, you think of something that you didn't ask, um, uh, you can send us an email and we will make sure that Jim gets the question and we'll send you an answer. And so um, again, our presenter today is Jim McGlinchey. He was the director of this project and he was the guy going all around the country, uh, frequent flyer miles, frequent uh, driving miles, um, and meeting with uh, groups and organizations across the country, educating them on the process, getting them uh, to, to register to vote and, and what have you. And he'll go through the whole process, but I just wanted to um, do a quick introduction to Jim. And then Jim, if you wanna expand on your background and how you got involved, um, that would be great if you, you could do that as part of your, uh, your report. So I'll kick it off to you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for being here. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this is pretty much the, the talk I give at these book launchings that I've given in Fall River and in Rhode Island. And it basically will start from the beginning and with the big question is why somebody named McGlinchey who lives in Washington, D.C. has been uh, sort of the coordinator of this Portuguese American Citizenship Project. We'll hopefully reveal that. And then just simply go through the whole whys and wherefores, what we found out what we didn't found out, find out and what the fatal flaws were and why this didn't continue forever. The, um, uh, just by background, I was a foreign service officer and with uh, a number of assignments, but my last assignment from 1992 to 95 was at the US Embassy in Lisbon, Portugal. And part of my duties was dealing with the Luso American Foundation. Uh, the Luso American Foundation is a, um, uh, it's, based in um, in Lisbon, but it part of its uh, ambit, the things that it gets involved in, is working with the Portuguese American community and trying to make them better. It's the Fundação Luz Americano para o Desenvolvimento de Portugal. It's the foundation for the development of Portugal, but part of their work is in the United States. Well, as part of, and then as, as a personal thing, I have to point out that I am half Portuguese. My maternal grandparents came from um, from the Azores, my grandfather from San Miguel and my grandmother from Fayel. I pointed out that I was also born in the 10th island of Fall River, which uh, qualifies me for full scale Portuguese citizenship. So with my Portuguese, half Portuguese background and talking with the foundation, it, it became pretty clear that they really had no policy. They have a lot of things that they've done in the United States. They've helped with the uh, Palkus over the years, they've helped with chambers of commerce, they have a lot of work in academia. But it became pretty clear that they had no policy and they had no real way of knowing what uh, the community actually needed. Uh, they're not going to build a daycare center in the United States because we're a very rich country and Portugal cannot afford to subsidize that. But they can help on the margins. So what they asked in 1998, they asked me to, uh, while I was working in the State Department, uh, to do a, a, just a 10 day trip up the East Coast um, and talk to people about, well, if the foundation's willing to help on the margins, what do you think they could do? They talked about a number of things. They talk, talked about cultural programs that are very important for people preserving their links to Portugal. Talked about Portuguese language instruction in the United States. Uh, they talked about chambers of commerce, a lot of things. But everybody pretty much said the belief was that we as a community, Portuguese American community are politically invisible. Now, that, that was the perception and what the reality was, was unclear at, at the time. So 
the foundation in 1999 said, well, can you take on this project? And um, well, first of all, I'm an economist. I live in Washington, DC. I spent all of two days in Fall River in the Portuguese community as an infant. So uh, I was the perfect person to do the job because usually people who are newcomers can take things on completely anew and, uh, and are not bothered by tradition. So the first things when we started this, it was called the Citizenship Action Program, was basically is that the foundation was willing to help. I had a two year guaranteed contract uh, to work for them and they would provide small grants to communities um, if they were involved, anything from promoting citizenship to voter registration to voting. But that was it, that was the strict limits. It was nonpartisan and it doesn't get into any issues at all. So three of the things that I found out immediately when I, uh, just in, in the short East Coast, and I um, must point out this was all East Coast in 1998, that it was clear that, that some communities were politically engaged, for instance, in Rhode Island, and some, some very nearby, for instance, in Fall River and New Bedford, felt like second-class citizens in terms of political events. Second thing was it was clear that the communities didn't talk to each other. Uh, New Jersey didn't talk to Rhode Island. Rhode Island didn't talk to Massachusetts. In New Bedford, uh, Mount Carmel doesn't talk to Immaculate Conception. The clubs don't talk to the churches. People worked within, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, politically, political campaigns. And the third thing, and these things are so perfectly obvious, anybody who had no experience with political organizing would see it, it was clear that the management of civic promotion efforts were more allied with time-honored techniques rather than basic business practices. If you're doing a nonprofit uh, volunteer effort, the, the idea is just do good and uh, let things happen. But the problem is that volunteer time is as precious as money. And you should use it to the best effect. Uh, my example that I used, and I've seen this more often than I care to think about, is in uh, Massachusetts, they would get volunteers to staff these um, uh, little tables in August at these festivals. And so people will sit out in the sun trying to register people to vote. And that's all very fine and very honorable, but A, it used up a lot of time and energy, but there was no measurement about how many people these people, these, these individuals actually registered. And secondly, did these people actually vote? Uh, and if you don't really know what the end result is, it's really kind of a waste of time and, and an individual uh, commitment to do that. So that's how we started. We decided that we're going to have to uh, sort of approach this in a business-like fashion. Part of it was the offer to give small grants to communities. That forced organizing groups to come up with a plan a lot of people said, no, no, we're always in favor of promoting civic involvement, but uh, we just sort of do what we did last year and the year before that. So before the foundation would even consider uh, uh, giving a grant, and we're talking about anywhere from 1000 to $5,000, uh, they would have to come up with a written document saying this is what we were going to do and this is what we want to achieve. They, the, the, all the goals, all the objectives, all the rules and regulations were all the work of and originated from the clubs. Uh, the project did not come in to uh, any of these events with any fixed agenda. In fact, the, the virtue of my being a complete non-expert in is I couldn't advise anybody anyway. All I could do is listen and I'm very good at that. So in the transition, and this took place over a long, probably about two years of struggling to find the right, uh, the right methodology in which to work. Uh, we, we ended up with three um, basic things. First of all, the importance of measurement. The, the important measurement really is not just measuring for the hell of it, but measuring results so that we know we're going in the right direction. And we'll find in some of the data that, uh, that we came up with the, the importance of pointing your guns in the right direction. 
Uh, also, if you do something like a voter get out the vote campaign to measure results. The other thing is the voter registration and get out the vote campaigns uh, were really the basic things that we organized encouraging people to adopt U.S. citizenship. We got involved in the margins uh, when a pastor of a church or a club president was encouraged to uh, emphasize that. We f saw increased numbers, but that was more the responsibility of the organization's leadership rather than the citizenship project. Um, there was, in, and in the voter registration and get out the vote campaigns, it was important to understand and I, I keep stressing nonpartisanship, is we don't promote, promote any issue. We don't promote any candidate. We don't promote Portuguese American politicians. We just promote Portuguese American voting. Who a person votes for is completely up to them. It really, that was partly uh, just to protect ourselves because if somebody comes out against our project, and there were people against our project, uh, they, were, they couldn't do it publicly because you would be voting against democracy or you would not vote it. You would be criticizing democracy. And the third part of this was candidates nights, which uh, I'll discuss later, which we shamelessly copied out of Santa Clara, California as a way for the community to bring forth its concerns directly in front of the political establishment. Jim, I'm, I'm curious, you said there were some people that were against the project. What specifically did, were they against? Well, uh, th this is a bit of a side, like uh, we'll get back to the other part, but if you think about it, uh, mostly, in fact, solely, it was from Portuguese American politicians. And if you think really? about it, it's not disloyal, it's quite logical. If you're a political candidate and you have been elected 10 times in a row, uh, you're like a businessman. You're like, you're, this is what you do. You keep getting elected. If you get elected with 500 votes or 5,000 votes, you keep getting elected. Well, if you have something coming in, an unknown project coming in that's going to increase the voting turnout by 10 to 15 percent, that, in that introduces uncertainty. These aren't bad people, the people that didn't like this project, but they felt threatened. And politicians like to get reelected. Otherwise, they become ex-politicians. And so it really, at first, it was kind of shocking. But in fact, it's quite logical what some, in a very small minority, I must, I must admit, but no one really helped. Uh, there was only one political person that really went out of his way to help, and that was Paul Tavares, who was the state treasurer in Rhode Island. But besides that, uh, we have letters of endorsement, but no real um, backing. It's just the way it is. Understood. OK. Uh, OK, so if we go to this slide. So if we have data, like I, I said, the, the Portuguese community, especially in New England, felt politically invisible. And there was the famous 50% rule. 50% of Portuguese immigrants don't become US citizens. This was an urban legend that was repeated many times in 1998. 50% of Portuguese Americans don't become US citizens. 50% of those who do become citizens don't register to vote. And 50% of those who register to vote don't vote. Well, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if the political community and the Portuguese community themselves believe this to be true, uh, then it, nobody pays attention to the community. Well, what we did is when we, we developed a system, and I think it's unique, and I, I keep saying this, and I'm willing to listen to anybody that says that, oh, we do that too, is we would take a, an organization's membership list, and this is Sacred Heart Parish in Turlock, California, and they would give us their membership list. And they, would, they would have the heads of households, if you'd see that, 7,770 registered voters. We can marry that with the voter registration rolls of Stanislaus County, and we can say that 2,540 of the heads of household of that 7,000 are registered to vote. And of that, because, you know, if Mr. and Mrs. John Smith are the heads of household, they may have adult children or senior citizens in the house. So actually there's 3,546 members of that church community that are registered to vote. That's a large number of people. Uh, and then also how you vote is secret, whether you vote is public information. And we would go back and look at vast, at past 
voting performance. And if you look at comparable statistics in, say, uh, uh, November of 2002, 76% of the church church's family members voted versus 49% for the general population of the county. Uh, in November of 2004, it was 83.5 versus 62.5. So not only are Portuguese American communities uh, numerous, uh, have a lot of registered voters, but they actually vote a lot. This is a data from California. In uh, Mount Carmel Parish in New Bedford, uh, you would have, we estimated, and I'll talk about that in a second, that 40% of the church are not US citizens. But of the remaining members of the church, it works out that there's like over 2,500 registered voters connected with Mount Carmel Church. It makes Mount Carmel Church the largest collection of registered voters in the county of Bristol uh, in Massachusetts. The second place uh, collection is a Portuguese American church and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. They're all Portuguese American churches. Nobody comes in, you're working into seventh, eighth, and ninth before you get into other, other community organizations. So in, in one sense, the 50% rule had some validity in the inner city churches. But in the other sense, a politician doesn't really care how many of your members are not citizens or are citizens. They care how many people you can bring to the polls. And it can scare the hell out of them when you start talking about numbers like over 2,500 people. So in the next thing we, we discovered, and this is again, you go to the next slide. What we could do too is we could also, again, this is with the whole thing of understanding what, what we're trying to deal with. Um, it's a St. Elizabeth Parish in Bristol, Rhode Island, which is not a working class community. It's a very uh, suburban type of thing with a large Portuguese community. And we could go in and do a statistical survey and find out that it estimated 11% of the community are not U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens registered to vote are 58%, and U.S. citizens not registered to vote are 31%. So this church doesn't have a citizenship project problem. It has a registering to vote problem. The next slide shows you a more relevant problem. Well, this, I'm sorry, with, with that number, like say with Mount Carmel Church, Our Lady of Fatima in Elizabeth, New Jersey, we would send out these cards to each and every member of the community. And basically it, it would give you your, uh, your name and an address. It would come from the church, a trusted source. And that would go to you and it would tell you when to vote in Portuguese and in English. It would give you the voting times. It would give you places who to call if, if you've got a problem. These things, because we go and measure, measure voter turnout, these things increase the voting turnout, especially in local elections, by 10 to 15 percent. They also leak into the official, uh, they will leak into City Hall. Some, some officials get these cards themselves because they're members of churches. Uh, and it basically signals to the political establishment that this, play, that this organization is serious about uh, our voter mobilization. We did this for every election both local, school board, uh, water boards, uh, not water board, water, uh, whatever it is in California that you have, water regulation, uh, water boards is another term, um, water regulation. But we do it continuously because the idea is you don't do this as a one-time event. We would send out 70,000 of these a year uh, for elections, especially in uh, national elections. And it, it has, has an effect. Now the next slide is showing you what the importance of data is. This is Santo Cristo Parish in Fall River, California. And this data also allows us to see who, how people vote. And if you look at the under 30 uh, category, that is the large of the blue is the largest collection of registered voters. The, uh, the burgundy there is the amount that they vote. So if you're running a voter uh, civic promotion campaign, trying to get people under 30 to register to vote is a waste of time. They're all registered. There are so many avenues for them to register. The problem there is getting them to vote. 
you know, being registered is a necessary but not sufficient condition to uh, succeed in this. And my age group, I'm uh, over 70 years old by a margin. We may be small in numbers, but we turn out to vote. Uh, the 60 to 70 is probably the most numerous. So there's no prizes for guessing what uh, issues uh, politicians, whether they're young, middle-aged or old, care about. They care about people that vote. They also, the second part shows that uh, the, the voter turnout, that, the, the problem of youth voting is not uh, limited to the Portuguese community. It's a nationwide event. But you can see the Santa Cristo turnout at all points uh, out, um, outvotes the city but, uh, from the Fall River turnout. So they always beat the average. But the problem is, is if you started turning on young people to vote, you would have a whole new pool of voters. You could see this in 2008, I believe, when Obama first ran, and in 2012, when he ran the second time. This spikes in the Portuguese community and overall, because he turned on people to, turned on the young community to vote, and that's probably why he won. Uh, the next slide. So the third and final piece of this puzzle was Candidates Night. This has been going on since 1994, four years before we actually even thought about doing a citizenship project. This is a picture of the city council, uh, candidates for city council in Santa Clara, California, speaking before the Portuguese community. And these, these people in the audience are all members of the community. The importance of this is not just to get a big crowd in front of uh, these candidates. It's the style of these candidates nights that's worth um, talking about. Candidates for political office want to talk about the things that they're comfortable with. Like if I'm running for city council, I can pledge to you that we're not going to get involved in a war in Iran and that uh, we're going to build nuclear aircraft carriers, whatever you want to do, anything national. It's very easy. You can talk about gay marriage. You can talk about the right to life. You can talk about all these things. These are candidates for city council. The people in the city don't want to talk. They want to talk about that to the people concerned with whether you're going to build a national, an aircraft carrier or wage war in Iran. But if you're talking to the city council, you want to talk about safety in the streets. You want to talk about taxes. You want to talk about the school system. The beauty of the Candidates Night Forum in Santa Clara is they determine what the issues are. They come up with the questions and they ask the candidates what their opinions are. Uh, and it becomes very uncomfortable for the candidate. Well, it's not uncomfortable, but it is comfortable because it's not a debate. Uh, John Doe would say, oh, this is my reply to that. And then he would have two minutes. Then Mary Smith would have two minutes. And they're enjoined from contradicting the other person or to criticize the other person. We just want to hear what they have to say. This becomes very interesting in New Bedford because we copied them. I mean, literally, we just simply Xerox their whole playbook and took it to uh, to the East Coast. And in New Bedford, uh, at one candidate's night, the ladies, and there were mostly ladies that organized these things, came up with a question. There was a candidate's nights for the district attorney. And the question was, there are four open drug markets within illegal drug markets uh, within walking distance of this church. Everybody here in this, this hall knows where they are. Why are they allowed to exist? That's a tough question. If you're the incumbent, you have to answer why you tolerated this. If you're the challenger, you have to come up with some credible plan to solve the problem. Uh, another question, this came out in Santa Clara. He said, well, and this, and the question came out uh, before the crash in 2008, 2007. They said, well, listen, times are well, you know, everything's going well. We know you support libraries. We know you support uh, more salaries for teachers and you want this and that and the other thing. But if times get tough and the city budget has to be contracted, which of these programs would you be willing to contract, you know, to, to cut back on? The only person that actually replied to that was said, said, and this is all he said, he said, that's a really good question. And then moved on. <laughs> okay, so so that that's really the suite of things that we did. Uh, and we did that virtually continually, continuously over the, um, the 16 year period. In 2008, the stock market crashed and the Luso American Foundation was unable 
to fund us uh, any further. And they funded us generously over those years. Uh, and so in 2009, I, I went to Lisbon and basically it was thanks to the memories type of uh, um, a tour. Uh, well, let me step back. It, it, it's very unusual for a foundation to fund a project for more than two to three years. You're supposed to stand on your own. And we were never able to solve that problem and more on that in a second. So in 2009, we, I went with uh, several members of the Loser American Foundation to the Azores to thank them for their help. And uh, unexpectedly, the Azorean government said that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna fund this for the next three years for 50,000 euros a year, which was a shock to everybody. So we got a second lease on life and then proceeded till 2013 and working off that. In 2015, we basically, all of our grants uh, expired. And at, at every point, we were constantly being asked, why can't you raise money on your own? And in the last meeting that I had with Dr. Vasco Ratu uh, here in Washington, DC, he said, well, look, you know, you, you have to explain why, uh, why you can't fund yourselves after all these years. And uh, quite honestly, there was no good answer. And so that was the fatal flaw. And so in 2016, we voted to, uh, you know, to curtail, not to curtail, to shut down the operation. Because we don't, didn't want to exist just for the sake of existing. We could only do it if we were doing a quality project. So the balance of accounts is in the book. There is uh, Portuguese, uh, the final report. You go to the next slide. Is that we, uh, to the best of our knowledge, nobody else does what we do. And we've asked continuously. Actually, the Catholic Church in California, Catholic Conference in California paid us to use our system to help them in 2004, to employ hard data to measure the political strength of participants. And if you're, if you're backing uh, anybody for a political office, if you're backing John Doe for an office, you can tell on the election whether he won or lost. If you're back in a bond issue, you know whether you won or lost. We only know by voter turnout and we use that. So the post-election uh, evaluations of voter turnout are important. And the forums where the grassroots community concerns are brought directly before candidates, I think is the vital important part. But again, as I said, fundraising from US donors was the one problem that never went away. And it was the fatal flaw that brought the project to an end. But the closing, and the next slide it says the closing of the central organizing function eliminated national synthesis. There was no more data collection. There was no more uh, reports being written. And there's the coordination of civic promotion campaigns. I can't tell you how many miles I've driven up and down I-95 or up and down uh, 99 uh, going back and forth to different communities. But the point is that the operating manual still exists and the underlying support is undiminished. And most importantly, None of the individuals who made the project run have gone away and we're all willing to help anybody to continue the struggle. When we started this, basically uh, we warned people that this, that uh, civic involved, promotion of civic involvement is a marathon, not a sprint. Well, it's neither because there is no finish line. We're always involved and you can't back down. If you're satisfied that you have reached political maturity and you don't need to do anything else, you're undoubtedly going to be moving backwards because other people are moving. There is no such thing as a status quo in this business. So that's it. That's, uh, that's what we did. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, that's quite an effort, Jim, um, and something that spans 16 years. It's uh, quite a bit of data. Um, in general, um, I'm curious to know if uh, you know, the, the trends you were seeing in, in voter registration and then also voter participation, um, is that directly proportionate to your efforts to go out there and push people to do that? Or do you think that, that now that this effort kind of has been underway that it will continue and people will continue to vote? Um, and, and I think, that, I, think I, I know your answer, but it also kind of speaks to the future of this kind of work and, and who takes it on and where does it go and things like that. So I'm just, I'm just curious as to what the trend is and how we can maintain, you know, the, the level of voting in our community. 
Well, I, I think there are some people, and it's a partial answer. Uh, I'm an economist. There's never such thing as a clear answer. But there, there are some people, uh, Helena Marcus, Helena Silva Hughes from the Immigrant Assistance Center, called me one time in 2003. She said, I have to tell you, we just took uh, some senior ladies to the polls for the first time to vote. And she said, I can't tell you the amount of energy on that bus when we came back. Those people are always going to vote. They're, mm -hmm. they're, you don't have to do anything else. In fact, you do not want to be a, an official standing in front of them when they're going to vote the next time. That's not the problem. So it's on the margins. It's young people. It's getting people, people to care about local elections as much as they care about presidential and national elections. It, that, that's where the community strength gains. Uh, and I think that falls off. I think mm. when, when you don't have that, those reminders, when the president of the Grupo Amigos de Terceda doesn't send you a card to say, well, you know, I forget, and well, I had something else going on. And it has an effect. At one point, five years into this, we found at one church in uh, New England that, um, you know, that everything was up, up, up. And then this one election, they actually undervoted the city. And it was really, well, let's figure, well, the voter cards have lost their currency. You know, they're no longer uh, uh, useful. Well, I called up the organizer and she said, I forgot to send out the cards, hmm. which was really good news for me because <laughs> what it said, it was like, it was like a sociological experiment. You turn on the switch, it goes up. You turn off the switch, it goes down. So yes, I think, I, yes, there, we're not the only dog in this fight. There's a lot of people out pushing. They've been involved long before we started and they're going to be involved long after we ended. So I think we helped. And I think there's going to be, there are continually things going on. I think in California, uh, there's uh, stuff going on right now, but I don't know. I, 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 uh, I can't say what, I can't give you a conclusive answer to that. Okay, that's fair. Um... And if there are any any questions uh, uh, from our uh, attendees online, just go ahead and put those questions in the chat box, and I will um, ask them over. I'll ask them to Jim. Um, where would you like to see the project go? Like in your ideal mind, um, what does it look like moving forward? Is it something that each community takes on individually? Um, what's the freak? Or maybe a better question is, what's the frequency of let's say your voter registration drives or mailing out cards or things like that. Because I think maybe somebody might be watching this and, and think that's all fine and good, but there's no way I could commit to doing something every month or, you know, it's not some, you know, another full-time job, if you will. So what would be a good, I guess, guide for somebody who's interested in trying to keep up this effort in their community? Well, all right, the ideal community, and it would have to be a large organization. And it's, it's just not a, a religious bias, but it has to be a, usually a church. The church's number in the thousands, uh, the club's number in the hundreds. If you have a church, and churches, some of these churches have, uh, th there's a program called Faithful Citizenship in the Catholic Church, and basically it, uh, from the National Council of Catholic Bishops, and saying, look, it's we have our values and we want to create a just society. Um, but I guess the analogy is if you want to go work in a soup kitchen, it's probably a good idea for you to vote for somebody that's going to support soup kitchens. It's all a continuum, you know, not only your private life and the whole range of issues. Like obviously the Catholic church has issues, but they're a not-for-profit uh, organization also. They can't tell people how to vote, nor do we. That's why we worked. In. So the, probably the most likely would be a church group they would say, yeah, we can do this once a year. Uh, we can organize ourselves. All you have to do is just one thing. Do a candidate's night. You don't even have to do the voter cards. If you organize your community, and they're doing this in Santa Clara since 1994, uh, Maria Ricardo and her group of, uh, of uh, gentlemen that, that she, uh, they, they, the Portuguese American form of Santa Clara, I believe it, their name is, uh, they, do, they have done this every two years, uh, and they are extremely powerful. They, they mm -hmm. are so powerful that when, and this isn't connected to politics, uh, that when the San Francisco 49ers were contemplating moving to Santa Clara out of San Francisco, it was a big political issue in the town. And the, the powers that be in the National Football League sought out 
Maria Ricardo's group and said, can we stage or can we uh, uh, have uh, an event with your organization telling of the benefits of having uh, this uh, stadium in your community? And Maria maintaining the completely nonpartisan uh, nature of it said, we'd be happy to and honored to, but you have to understand that we will invite the people that are against your project also, <laughs> which of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think the mere fact that they sought her out is huge. It, mm -hmm. it is incredible. And that that's only done every two years with a lot of effort. It's not, it's not a gift. She doesn't just like snap her fingers. They don't snap their collective fingers and it happens. They do it, but when they do it, I mean, they can't get off it because the city council of Santa Clara actually demands that they have it because they want the opportunity to talk to the community. Anybody can do that. Uh, the voter cards I think are extra that takes a lot of effort of organizing things, the measuring data, but we can work with people on that and show them how to do it. There is a group in Hudson, uh, Massachusetts that does this. They don't do candidates nights. They don't do voters. What they do is go through every name in the voter registration rolls of Hudson, uh, Massachusetts. And most of them are from Santa Maria Island in the Azores. So they're all related hmm. and they call them all. I mean, that, you talk about face-to-face -face contacts and they do every election also. And they are incredibly successful. When they, uh, when their candidates and sometimes they, they uh, support people, uh, they don't, out, they don't beat everybody else. They lap everybody else. Like have twice the number of votes as everybody else. I mean, these things can be done, but I think the important thing is you have to have an attitude. The one common thing with the Rhode Island success, people that are very successful in Rhode Island, with Santa Clara and with Hudson is attitude. There is no pesa de scupo. Don't apologize for mm -hmm. it. You know, we, we have the right to demand uh, our share of the society. We have our, our demands should be listened to with respect. Not all are granted. We live in reality. Uh, but there's no holds barred. Uh, and uh, I think when you go in with a positive attitude and an aggressive attitude, things happen. It's good. It's a good point. Uh, so we don't really have any other questions, but I think this information is just really helpful. And uh, we will obviously keep in touch and hopefully the project or the, you know, the work will continue in some form. And perhaps it's even something that, you know, you and I, Jim, have talked about that Tonkas uh, could take over um, in some some form. So uh, stay tuned, everybody, to see where, where that goes. Um, uh, so with that, I'll just say that, you know, all of our webinars are archived on our website as well as our YouTube channel. And so uh, after this, if you were, um, you know, unable to catch the entire webinar or you missed it completely um, or your friend missed it completely, you can send them to our YouTube channel and all of our webinars are there. We will also provide a PDF of the presentation on our Facebook page and our, web and our website. So please share with your family and friends because these are meant to be shared to, to educate the community on various um, initiatives. And there is an opportunity to sponsor a webinar you know, these are free to the community, um, but we do need your support to keep to keep it free um, and to help pay for the service that we use to to create the webinars. And so, um, you know, we are reaching um, tens of thousands of people. And so if you are interested in, in contacting or in sponsoring, please contact us at palcus at palcus.org. And with that, thank you again, Jim, for for doing this. It's a, such a, an amazing uh, initiative. And for anybody that would like to purchase the book, uh, just go to the website uh, at the beginning of the uh, webinar and you can purchase the book right there from the website. And, uh, but thank you, Jim, for being here. And thank you everybody for attending. And until next time. Well, just at one point. Sure. Uh, uh, it, it, the website will direct you to how you can vote it. Uh, the PortugueseAmerican.org gives you uh, instructions on where you can go to purchase the book. Purchase, right. But I'd like to also thank you for staging this and thank you for your valuable work and your commitment to the community. Thank you, Jim. All right, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.